Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Comic Tom. And I am the Golden Age Guru, Jeff. And I'm Fire Guy Ryan. We're here to chat with you about comics, but a little different this time. This is our first podcast, and you can listen to it on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you would do such a thing. But before we get into the show, because we have a packed show filled with comic book news, updates, and goodness, well, we got to say thank you to our sponsor of the show. The first one is what makes the show happen, the Mystery Mail Call, my comic book subscription service where we send comic books out to the community monthly. We package them up and send a box to your door. You can hit the link in the description or visit comictom101.com to join the community. The other sponsor of the show is Key Collector Comics, the best comic book collecting app that exists on the internet. And if you use code TOM101 in the coupon code, you get a free week subscription. How dope is that? I think it's spectacular. I love the app. I mean, it's... As up to date as anything you're going to find, if if not greater. I mean, it's really the most current app I can find, or, or even site. Period. That's going to let me know what's happening on the movie front, the comic collector dollar bin front, anything. I love it. Without further ado, let's get into the show. Oh, so good to be here. And you know what? I touched a lot of comic books this week. Jeff, what was the first? What was the last comic book you touched? I just finished handling a Human Torch 34, so it's a timely book. Always with the gold, my yeah, man. Yeah, Sun Girl cover, or Human Torch cover. You know, anytime you can touch a timely, you love your timely. It's a good day. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? Uh, literally, the last comic I touched was uh, right in front of me. I got Powers of X and House of X. Ooh, and Ryan's gonna be talking a little bit about both of those, and that's gonna be exclusive to our audio listeners. Some bonus content for those of you who are listening to us via those podcast streaming services that I mentioned. Let's kick off the show with something fun here. We have key collector notifications that pop up on the app. This is the most up-to-date news. This is a way, a tool that you can use to keep up on what's going on in the community, and I think the most the biggest news that happened this week, that, as I was notified for, um, was that the director of the New Gods, Ava DuVernay, she has confirmed the female Furies will absolutely be in the new New Gods film. Also, that has been confirmed is that in her script, after being asked if Darkseid would be in the movie, she then quoted Gerard's cover to Mr. Miracle number 12. Darkseid is. Darkseid is. Classic. Oh. That's a classy move. How do you feel about that? Because that means that we got Dark Side hitting the screen. And that also means that we have things like a bunch of comic books from Mr. Miracle spiking. Mr. Miracle number six is the first female Furies. We also have Superman pal Jimmy Olsen 134, the first appearance of Dark Side. Yeah, I'm super excited. I mean, we're literally bringing in the strongest or one of the strongest DC villains there is. I mean, like, we just saw Thanos in Marvel Universe. Let's just hope that Darkseid can do a fraction of that for DC. And I'll be happy with just a fraction. That's Absolutely. true. The bar is pretty low for DC films lately. So I think uh, anything, anything they can do, I think Darkseid is a pretty, pretty solid option, especially if, uh, if she's clearly uh, familiar with the recent Tom King, Mr. Miracle run. So hopefully she can uh, take some clues out of there. I want to chat about one of the funnest comic books that has hit my Instagram page over at Comic Tom 101 in a long time. We're talking about the famous, this is now famous, guys. It made press this week, like mainstream media press. This is a book that has seen dealers' hands multiple times. What do I mean by that? Well, we're going to get into it. We're talking about The Angry Girlfriend, Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 14. Is that like an official title? The Angry Girlfriend variant or something? It, it's becoming that, that's, yes. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's kind of what it's known by. Yeah, I mean, what, what uh, is this? What is this thing? Yeah, I mean, this is like, this is that urban legend in, in the collectible that you hear about, but we got to see it, and it's, it's an Amazing Spider-Man 14. Huge, major key for Spider-Man collectors. I mean, his first appearance of Green Goblin. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> and the cover is one of the best covers that Steve Ditko did. Absolutely. For, for that run. And so this uh, girlfriend, uh, ex-girlfriend, I guess. Um, yeah, I think she's an ex-girlfriend, man. <laughs> she wrote right in the front. Okay, so let's, let's, let's explain this because to our audio listeners, they can't see this comic book. But imagine an ASM-14. Yeah, you have like this sand dripping down. You got Green Goblin, very prominent. You even have the Hulk at the bottom. Okay, but out of all that, all you see is this big lettering box that says, Chance. 
who is the guy's name, I'm assuming. Yeah, pedigree status yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> pedigree, that's right. Chance, <laughs> chance pedigree. Um, go to hell. In Sharpie. <laughs> In Sharpie. Big, bold Sharpie. But it also says something else on the cover. Oh, there's more. She's not done. <laughs> She's not done. It says turn over. Okay, so imagine coming home to this comic book. First off, on the counter. Worst book that you could see. Do you on think the she counter. knew? Do you think she knew it was the first appearance of Green Goblin, or oh. she just grab a book and write on it? Well, if you flip the book over, I think the answer is there. I think it's there, but this is, I'm going to read this verbatim, okay, what she wrote. It wrote, in no way am I trying to be noble or anything like that. It, and the entire back cover is written. I mean, every square inch is written in Sharpie. Yep. Okay, this is not just a little box that she wrote it in. I never thought I'd be able to destroy something that meant so much to me. As far as I'm concerned, you're dead. Oh, okay. So this was definitely something that was almost probably shared. I imagine this being some type of a uh, collectible that they bonded over. That's actually a good point because I just assumed that when she said so much to me, I felt that she meant that was the relationship they oh, had. Oh, that, that probably is what is going on there. Because you'd think it would say it's something that meant so much to you because it's his comic and she right. defaced it. And, and then, yeah, maybe it was a shared experience for both of them or, yeah, the relationship in general. Oh, my goodness. But what's interesting about this comic book is that it's been known in the community that this book has been floating around. And typically books like this, higher dollar books, they float between dealers a lot on the con floor. This is something that multiple dealers handled and it would float between booths. But it made its way onto Instagram and it also made its way to CBCS and got graded at a 1.8. Minor restoration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go figure. And to see it in a 1.8 holder, I mean, it was raw for the longest time. And a 1.8 grade is going to sell for right now, with the market being kind of hot, five to $600. Right. Okay, but this still has horrible eye appeal. I mean, obviously, it's sharpied up. <laughs> but this will sell for way more than that because of just the history it has. And how many people actually want? I would pay way more than that for this book. So this book hit mainstream press. It, it got a little bit of that story to it. And now it's being sold on the market. I couldn't find it listed on eBay or anything, but this is a post that went through and there is a dealer out there who has it. And the rumor is that the price on this is now $5,000. Yeah, it is so, one of a kind. <laughs> it is. But I find this also very I'm going to use the word interesting again, but it is interesting because this is an example of a comic book that's a key. Yes, it's, a, it's ASM 14, but it has this added layer of inflation because the community, the comic book collecting community, has deemed it like an extra key. Like there's more to the status of this book. I think of, um, what am I thinking of, Jeff? I'm thinking of World's well, Finest. Yeah, World's Finest, 153. That's right. Okay. The, yeah, the, got, the classic the, meme panel. Yeah, we've all seen it. And some verbiage to go with it. I mean, you literally have Batman slapping the Boy Wonder Robin across the face. We've seen this meme. I right. mean, this is you. You type in Batman slap on your phone for GIFs. You're yep. going gonna to see that. And there are a handful of books like this that are cheaper. They're minor or they're not key status at all. But because of a panel, because of something on the cover, the community has given it that title. Yeah, I mean, we see that across all generations of comics. Even in the Golden Age, there's a cover, Captain America Comics, uh, I believe it's 65, mm -hmm. where Captain America, like, backhands Bucky on the cover over uh, this girl that he was trying to date. I mean, that's basically what it looks like. Right. And, like, just, it's really only known for that. It's a later post-war issue, which doesn't have any other real collectability for a lot of people. It's kind of a lame cover. But Bucky's getting slapped by Cap. There are, I'm thinking now, of ALF issue number 48, that classic seal cover. It looks like something else is happening. It's not, obviously. But because the perception is there, the book gets that inflation. And I find that fascinating. All right. Something else I found fascinating this week was information on Rain. Who is Rain, Ryan? Wolverine's daughter. Your favorite. Yeah, this is a weird uh, combination of multiple favorites of mine. Sarcasm. Yeah, you, you love it when they make characters, uh, you know, like the child of a famous character. I've already got a bone to pick with Wolverine, personally. So that's, that's just a bad starting point. And then, and then they throw in Wolverine's daughter now, which I guess is the thing, I feel like, these days. To kind of give a, a comic character a kid, it seems like. I mean, it's been a thing for a while. Sure. Wolverine's had a few children over the years, I guess. In my mind, the most notable being 
Dake, Dakin or da- how yeah. you say it. And he's got like the two claws, and he was like kind of evil and bad for a while. And I, yeah. I, 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 let me expand on this because I'm with you on this. Like, I love Wolverine. I do. You sure. may not like him. I like him. But he doesn't have a history with being a good father. I right. Mean, and who, who's the mother? <laughs> like, that's never addressed. Like, who's the other parent in all these scenarios? The guy in theory, I think, has been around since like 1880 or something. Because of yeah. his healing factor, he's like. Pff, he just barely knows. I don't know what, whatever. He just looks as good as he does. But like, if you take all the multiverses and worlds, he's had like, from what I read, like over 15 kids. And if you're talking about just 616, the main Marvel universe we're talking about, right. I mean, he had Dakin and he had the Mongrels, which he didn't know they were his kids till later, but he killed them all. <laughs> I mean, he, like, he hasn't been a stand up figure as a father. And there's like, so it's just interesting that they keep giving him a kid. And it's always a tumultuous relationship. You well, know? it's funny you mentioned that because there was a panel leak before the the next issue came out for Marvel Comics Presents. And the leak of the panel was that Rain was saying that Wolverine isn't her father. Now this one panel made its way out, made its way out, and across the community, people started sweating. A lot of people bought this comic book, man. Like variants of this book there's a sketch variant going for over 150 dollars of the first like full appearance the reveal that it's his daughter and for a day collectors thought oh my goodness i think i just wasted money and the spec news oh my goodness it it caused chills on people's spines people thought they just wasted all their money now fortunately bleeding cool posted that they were able to confirm like don't worry this indeed is wolverine's daughter she's just like She's not accepting it yet. So no worries. You didn't waste your money. But there was a solid amount of time, a full day, where collectors thought, oh my goodness, I was a victim of the speculation game. And I think it's a good reminder here that that's actually something that happens. I mean, how often do we buy comic books and then stuff just doesn't pan out? We didn't move them fast enough. Maybe we overpaid thinking that it would go up down the road and it just didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I've spec'd on a lot of stuff. I mean, it's a spec market, right, for the last decade now plus. And I remember speculating on books and waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing happened. And then I sell them and then something happens, finally. Or nothing ever happens. Or you hold on to them too long. I mean, it's part of the market. I get it. I, I'll still do it. Right. I'm not not doing it. You know. And if I saw that panel of like Wolverine's daughter, I would have picked up a second copy or third copy in that store. Right. I mean, why not? Just in case, four bucks. Yeah. And you know that I feel like that is part of the the understanding that you need if you're going to get into the game of, of speculation anyway that you have to kind of prepare for maybe something is going to not pan out and like you might overpay for something and, and end up with a with a clunker on your hands because of some something that got retconned later on in comics for example the word spec i mean it's an abbreviation and you know, it's, it's a verb you know but it's short for speculation and there's a risk with speculation i think that we got to constantly remind ourselves that that is what that is you could lose money in putting money towards these types of titles. Be weary, but also if you're up on your information, you can make those moves with a sound decision. Like what happened? What happened with Crush? That's a good point. What happened with Kingpin's daughter? Yes. Didn't uh, Venom have a daughter for a while? Like Eddie right. Brock had a daughter. Like we, everyone's got a daughter. In the last year, man. Yeah, it's it seems really cheap, and it reminds me of. I mean, I don't I don't want to compare it, but because it seems to be panning out right now. But uh, a few years ago, when Marvel would just switch every character, when they made Thor a female, when they made um, Bucky and then Falcon got the Captain America mantle, and some characters just started switching. And at the time, I felt like it was a personal... I, f- I personally felt like it was just a... a uh, exam- an, Not even that, but like an example of them running out of ideas and just trying sure. to just mash things together and throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And I'm getting that same feeling now from all these, all these children of established superheroes. It feels like a cheap way to kind of throw a new character into the mix... And then it's kind of easy. Yeah. A little easy. Well, we're going to have to keep an eye on this, you know, because it's Wolverine. His status is there. And that's why this book is seeing growth. But you know what? People are still buying it out. And if you have a copy, as far as we know right now, it's still Wolverine's daughter. You're still good. Okay. Option news. We had some option news. Not a whole lot of option news this week. And we've talked about this before. What is, Ryan, if something gets option, what does it mean? It means that it's. Potentially, that it's that somebody <laughs> behind the scenes is looking at it to adapt to a movie, TV show, some other form of media other than 
the original source material. And possibly that is the word that we need to use. Sometimes, yes. you know, if we're seeing something on variety, you know, variety reports, they typically and when I, I don't even want to say they typically they they hit it out the park with their reporting. Well, on variety it. and like Hollywood Reporter, like the two big like Hollywood yeah. like trade magazines, and they're usually pretty authoritative on this stuff. Yeah. Amazon does something, they're going to report on it. You know, they're one of the first two. But there are other businesses that their job is to option titles. Now, do they even have funds to take it to the screen? No, because there's something valuable in being able to say your title was optioned. So there are, there's a business model there. So that's why we hear so many things get optioned and why we see so many actually hit the screen. How many times have we talked about Batgirl hitting the screen? Mo Joss, Joss Whedon was put up next to that title being sold for a long time. He got close. Got close, but no cigar. Well, option, that's what it means. But we're going to cover them and give you our thoughts because this past week we had Farmhand by Rob Gilroy get optioned. And this is something I'm excited about. Rob is fantastic. I was introduced to him with Chu. Ryan, you got me into Chu. You got me into Chu. Oh, I did. Yeah, that's right. You got me into Saga. That's right. I got you into Chu. I'm getting all mixed up now. Yeah, it is time. I've known you for a long time, man. Yeah, indeed. Now, how would you describe Chu? Uh, very unique. Very, very unique. About what is he like? Was he? A, was he? A, was he a detective? Yes. Okay. Yeah, he has this ability to like whatever he cybopath or something i'm forgetting I the I name i forgot the name but whatever he tastes or eats he can kind of like see the history of that thing that's right and uh it starts out with him eating food and figuring out like where it came from or like how the apple got picked from the tree yeah he's, uh, they, he sees everything from like the worm that touched the apple to right. the farmer who picked it to the to the oh it got dropped on the ground and dirt got on it and an ant also touched it like he sees all of that so then as a cop he he comes across this murder case and decides that you know maybe i should take a bite out of this guy and figure out what happened that's right and you cannibalism know, the story just kind of goes from there so okay so chew is a great example of something that's just a gold nugget idea and rob is fantastic because that's what he does when he draws a comic it's a gold nugget idea, and that's what we have here with Farmhand. This Did you is, get optioned? Is that ever optioned? It has. That's another one that's that has That's going to be a had, weird movie if that ever happens. It that's, needs to be a, um, like an animation to. or something. Yeah, it's, it's got to be a cartoon. <laughs> it's, it's a little too dark to make a live action, I think. I, I agree, and it's fantastic. I mean, chicken is illegal in that run. But anyways, I digress because we're talking about Farmhand, a completely different comic book that's about a farmer who plants body parts. Ooh. Still kind of morbid, right? Along those same lines, so... I kind of like the concept. Science meets post-apocalyptic. It's just a perfect timing for this. I mean, with Walking Dead ending, zombie stuff is at an all-time low. What do we have coming? Marvel zombies? Eh, who cares? Well, Farmhand. I'm excited about this. This is an affordable book that's out there. Check your half-price books. Check your dollar bins. I mean, heck, dealers aren't even really specking on this book because, again, option news doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. So um, I recommend Farmhand, and I know a lot of people would. All right, another book that I've recommended so many times to people. I mean, I got a copy of it. Do I have one here? I, oh, I do, right there. This is actually one of my favorite books that I own. This is Goon Number 7. It's a team-up of Hellboy and The Goon, and it's a cover done by Mike Mignola, and it's a 9-8 that I proudly own. The Goon is a fantastic series. It's supernatural. The art is fan it's just, it grip it's gripping. And there's so many individuals who have gotten involved with the goon that you're going to find just solid comic books that you're going to want to add to your collection. And you're going to want to get them graded at nine, eight, just because you love them. And that's some of my favorites that I collect. It's like, you just want to have it in a slab because you appreciate it so much. The goon. Another thing is that this is done by Albatross. This is done by Eric Powell. And he's doing something kind of interesting with the release of a couple comics. So there's an issue. Obviously, you when you do issues and you put them out for publication, they go numerically one, two, three, four, five, right? I Makes mean, sense. For 80, 90, I mean, how many years? That's what you do. Right. He is now going to go with one, two, three, five, four. Wait, what? He's going to publish them out of order. Publish them out of order. And you're like, okay, well, there has to be a reason, right? To, from what I'm seeing, there doesn't seem to be any real reason. Other, and each story is its own story, so you're not really going to miss anything in like a continuity type factor. Yeah, these are one shots. So you're basically just doing it to just do it. Yes. Now, this sounds weird, but I want to throw a caveat out there that Eric Powell is known to do things like this. Back when he released Grumble, he pumped out three different covers to issue number one and didn't tell anybody 
about the two other variants. When they came out, he went to his YouTube channel and said, hey, I did something funny. I have these secret variants that I'm sending out at random. This is somebody who understands the collector's market. This is someone who understands how to make a buzz. And I think that's what he's attempting to do here. He's like, all right, we're just going to release them out of order because, well, for one, Bleeding Cool will we'll, we'll report on it. It's going to cause a little bit of like confusion that's going to get retailers to have to explain it. I get the intention. What do you think about the execution? Ryan, what do you think? In my head, like when you first told me about this thing happening with the goon, uh, I was pretty intrigued. I'm a big uh, Quentin Tarantino person and like Pulp Fiction, for example, oh, okay. the I first see. scene yeah, yeah. is the end of the movie. Right. And there's, there's, there's a lot to be said for telling a story out of order. It makes it a little more interesting and makes, it makes you kind of get involved and, you know, like, what's, what's, what is this? I'm confused. I want to learn more. But if they are all standalone one shot issues, then one issue doesn't really flow into the next. It doesn't really matter. You can jump in at any time. So releasing number four, five, three, six out of order all the time it doesn't make too much difference in my mind if they're all standalone one shots. It would have been cool to see if he had put out like a, you know, a chapter of like a further chapter of a story before it should be released to just, to just confuse everybody for, yeah, for this, whatever reason. This for is one just month. ridiculous. It's just, Oh, Jeff, you don't I, like I just straight think this is stupid. <laughs> okay, I'm say, sorry. Say how it is. Tell us how you really feel, Guru. <laughs> like there is no real purpose other than to maybe have your buyers maybe Put an extra thought on why is five out before four? And then oh, did have, I, I missed an issue? Oh, wait, I missed an issue. I have to go talk to my shop owner, who then has to explain the situation, and then I just wasted all this time, and I didn't even care because the the the, the answer is not worth the <laughs> the, <laughs> the reasoning. For. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense. Like if you're trying to do something different, then do something different. Not change the numbering because that's not pushing your character or your story. That's you just messing with numbering and hoping that that somehow brings attention to your book. I, I just don't get it. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't seem smart to me. It seems like you're treating your readership like imbeciles almost and just dumb thinking that they're going to fall for some trick to buy your book. I, I don't get it. Yeah, I don't get it either, but I do appreciate the attempt. Imagine if they did it with Watchmen, yeah, like if they right. released Watchmen out of order. I'd be okay with that even. I'd be I'd be intrigued if they did one, two, four, then three, then because it's read, like a set series, right? And yeah. you read one of them out of order, and you're like, whoa! Like I know these characters kind of, but they're in different positions, and you know that you're skipping a chapter, and you're gonna get it later. Like if you're if you're along for the ride and you're fully invested, then I think it could be a cool experiment. But if they're all standalones, then that completely defeats any purpose. Missing goon. Well, rest assured, if you're finding yourself out your comic book shop, your LCS on a Wednesday, and you're looking for your goon, and you're seeing issue five, and you're thinking, oh, I missed one. I'd be panicking, yeah. I think I'd miss an issue. Yeah, I'd be like, what the heck, Russ? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> for real. You know, that's a real uh, thing that, that I'm sure as a comic book shop owner that he has every to... Every shop owner is going to have to deal with this, like you're saying. Everybody's yeah. going to have to explain to every one of their customers who's got this on their list. But isn't that part of the the marketing i don't know see we want to know from the community yeah. um if you know here on youtube since you have the comment section let us know in the comment section below what you think about this and what eric powell is doing efforts there i don't know if the execution was okay key collector dollar bin pick okay this right here is a category dollar bin diving on key collector the app there's a bunch of categories on there um, the app is filled with suggestions and how to navigate your collecting. And there's one category there that I find myself just scrolling when I'm bored because I'm just learning it's stuff. It's fun info. It like really Just to is. sit down and read, like even if you're not hunting currently at the moment, like just to look through. The Key Collector app category is called Dollar Bin Diving. This is a section of the app of just comic books that even the most seasoned dealers may not know are spiking. My pick of the week from the Dollar Bin category is Master of Kung Fu, issue number 125. Do you know what this issue is, Jeff? It's the last issue in the run. That's right. And why is that important? Well, historically, the last issue in the run is the last issue because people just stopped reading it. That's right. So generally, um, distribution is going to be far less than majority of the earlier issues. So it's just going to be harder to find. Harder to find, and collectors are willing to pay an inflated amount for it because there are typically less of them, and it's harder to find in high grade, especially like the Bronze Age, where a lot of these dollar bins, dollar bin books are filled with is Bronze Age comic books. Uh, Master of Kung Fu, um, there is a low price 
um, listed on Key Collector. You know, it's, it's a gauge on there of one dollar because the dollar bin book you can find, but a high dollar of twenty um, potentially to be sold if the grade is there. So keep an eye out for Master Kung Fu One Twenty Five, and also keep an eye out for last issues in series. There's also a category just for that on the Key Collector app. All right, moving on to other big news, and I'm you know I I threw this link out there to both of you and received similar responses. Spawn 300 is now being listed for pre-sale. We have images of the books. Is it going to land? That's the question. Yeah, I mean, we all know that people are going to buy issue 300 regardless. Well, it's an homage, right? Yeah, there's 11 covers. Okay, and you know half of them are going to be virgins because that's just a cheap way to make another cover for sale. Sure. Okay, mm-hmm. let's take away the title and call it a virgin variant and do no extra work. Well, it looks like there was no work done for these covers. All right, so for, to our audio listeners, you know, Spawn 300, you know this comic book to be an homage, so we don't even have to describe it to you. It's, do you know the homage? Yeah, I mean, look, we know Todd McFarlane. We know you did Spider-Man. We know, we know, we know. You know we know you did Spider-Man 300, but how many... Oh times do i need to see the jeff. same image spider-man 300 oh no you're wrong jeff you're wrong he's not wrong man he's taking away no, right no, no, out no, of no. my mouth no no that's you're wrong you're wrong you're, you're, yeah, this, I was isn't, right. this isn't a spider-man 300 homage this is an homage to spawn 227 <laughs> which was an homage to spider-man 300 <laughs> like we could the, the the well goes deep with this i, I didn't mean uh, to cut you uh, off no you're right you're right this is a this is an homage to spider-man 300 but we have seen this so many times has it is there any like umph to this comic book anymore i don't think so i mean look people are going to obviously want to buy it i mean it's classic all right but i'm tired of seeing it and the cover the cover the cover, the cover and then for the 300th issue i'd expect better covers in general like i look at all of them and they're just so we don't even have pathetic. to shvet it we're going to show them on youtube because you know i'll do the minimal editing for this long mm-hmm. video i do appreciate the comic book community hit that like button for us it goes a long way if you like this kind of content love you i need ryan to rant on this too we're, we're, he, yeah. he's going to he's he I, i'm i'm holding him back I'm here su- man. i'm surprised uh, jeff jeff is uh, speaking the same lines as me here i i feel the same way except my criticism of spawn has no basis whatsoever because i have never read or or watched spawn in any way i just know that i won't like it i just know yeah, you, you're well. Here's the thing, Ryan. You read a ton of comic books. Yeah, you read a lot. Of, you read more comic books than I do, and I read a lot of comic books, man. And you mentioned something here. It didn't get you at first glance. No, that's and a I problem, think especially for a, for a landmark 300 kind of issue. Like it's got to get people like me who've never read Spawn to get it because it's like, oh, this, this must be an important issue. It's probably going to be big. It's it's got a nice round number on it, 300. Like I better grab that just to just to have it, just so I know. That's the feeling. I have no desire. You should. I mean, yeah. I think of some of the things that gets people to buy comic books out the gate, like for the first time, it's typically these types of issues. I think of the Death of Superman. There was a lot of new readers just because of that polybag. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, Death of Johnny Storm. There was a lot of new readers yep. just because of that polybag. It was a milestone. They knew that if we do a key moment, that there's even some slight buzz that we're, they're going to sell it out. And it's a great opportunity to get people engaged. I don't think you get people engaged with any of the covers that I've seen. The coolest one is by J. Scott Campbell. I mean, it's cool. The glass behind it. Um, oh, the stained you know, glass one? The stained glass one. Yeah. It looks pretty cool, I guess. But, I mean, even the Greg Capullo. Like, these aren't exciting to me, especially after how awesome 298 and 299 were. Yeah, 299. I love that one with the creepy hands. Like, we mentioned the Nosferatu. Oh, you're talking about San Diego Comic-Con, the yeah, 1 in 500 variant. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm not sure what the other ones are. I just didn't pay that much attention. Those long Nosferatu fingers. At least there was one I really liked. And right. Yeah. And know. they just got done doing a, a big run of uh, Matina variants. Was he was doing uh, Spawn variants recently? And I feel like any one of those was cooler than any of the covers I've seen for issue 300. Bit of a disappointment. I looked at listings online, and a lot of the ones that have had a lot of the pre-sales. Like there's there's a handful of online dealers and retailers on ebay that are just going to be selling like the most of the issue at wholesale cost or rather slightly above and you can see like how many people are viewing the comics per hour and they're all above like 25 30 views per hour on these just you know cheap cover price issues right now i don't see these prices spiking like we saw like for example the recent walking dead final issue 
I don't see any of these spiking more than usual. I could be wrong, but you mentioned the San Diego Comic Con variant. That one in 500, man, that was hitting $500 last week. Spider Man 300 should have something of that stature. That, like, there should be something really exciting. And I haven't seen it yet. No, I haven't seen it. And I looked and I tried and uh, I was let down. I think it'd be a good time for Spawn, too, because you got Jamie Foxx and, you know, the movie, the new movie's starting to ramp up and, like, well, unfortunately, McFarlane's saying as of San Diego that he's struggling to get this movie made. Oh, wow. He's struggling. Um, It sounds like creative differences. The big thing was that he is stuck on making a horror movie. The one word that I mentioned in the top 10 last week when reporting on this book, when chatting about McFarlane, he used the word ugly. This film Mm -hmm. needs to be ugly. That's a very interesting word choice, but that's a strong word choice. He wants it difficult to watch. He said that he hates action movies where there's jokes involved. Well, maybe a theatrical release is not the way to go then. Possibly not. Might, but might just need to go straight to a streaming service where you can get a little more freedom. Because in a, in a movie theater, you're going to have to satisfy a lot of studio heads who are not going to want to put the word ugly anywhere near their movie. Absolutely. Well, he's going for that hard R rating. Yeah. He wants it horror. He doesn't want Spawn saying anything in the movie. But the big thing is that he let on the budgets of this movie. He said that, and this is also known, that Marvel and DC, these blockbuster movies, they're looking at budgets in like the 200 million, right? Like these are huge budget movies. This movie has been granted $20 million. He's, he knows that there is no way to compete with a blockbuster like this. It's like a big CGI flick, a green screen for 95% of it, major actors. Like this is not going to happen. He's got Jamie Foxx. He's got uh, Jeremy Renner. What he's going to do is focus on the collector's market, the people who love Spawn and who want to see just a really good dark movie. I'm excited. That would draw me in to watch Spawn, and that would probably get me to read more Spawn. We'll see if it happens. Yeah, a movie would get me to pick up Spawn finally, but... An ugly R movie yeah. would do it. I'd, I'd like to see, like, a... I'm interested to see the movie that Tom wants to see, like a, like a gross... Yeah. Like, something different. Different. Different is good. I mean, yes. saturation is... Um, I think Phase 5 is... They're going cosmic because I think they're worried about saturation. I think they're worried about... Or, excuse me, Stage 4... They're already planning stage five, but they're yeah. working on stage four, and their worry is probably set, you know, saturation. Like, we're, we're seeing a lot of these movies that kind of feel the same, you know? What's going to be different? You know, Deadpool was an R rated film, and it surprised a lot of people because it was different. It was raw. And it was uh, a major success. Like, that's the important had, part. It also had comedy to it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the character, I mean, like, if you're going to be dark and ugly, yeah, I mean, like, you're talking like we talked about it right. <laughs> just recently, right? $35 million budget. You had to grow seven hundred million. Yeah, I mean, if you think you can't do that, no, oh, good point. If you think you can't make money or a lot of money, then your script's not good. Oh, I like that. Or you're failing. I mean, you have Jamie Fox. Make it happen. Jamie Fox is pretty freaking amazing in my eyes as an Oscar actor. winner. Absolutely. So if you're not Jamie Fox is in there and you can't do it, then you wrote it wrong. Yeah. And you, di- you didn't predict your crowd right. Amazing Spider-Man too. And I don't care if you got that off your chest because you wanted to see what you wanted to see, but there's more people than just you who want to see this p- character portrayed. Guru spitting truth. Okay. Dropping mics here, guys. Dropping them. Dropping them. Dropping them. Okay. Another mic drop, because you, you brought up San Diego, and I'm All excited right. about that. So San Diego, we mentioned Spawn, going for a lot of money. I, I thought that was going to be the biggest book of the, of the, of the con. I mean, 500 bucks out the gate, one in 500. You mentioned that cover, dude, Nosferatu. Those long fingernails got me all excited. The color work is fantastic, but it wasn't. We find out this week that it wasn't the rarest comic. It wasn't the highest selling comic because the book that we're about to talk about hasn't even hit the the retail market yet because it was so low print. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Silver Surfer Black, right? Number two? Number two. This is the True Believers variant. Yeah, it's like 25 issues. That's it. There's 25, and they're numbered. Uh, in existence. In 25. Existence. And it's a black and white sketch version of the color one that's like Silver Surfer all carnageized, you know, when you... It sounds look, so weird. It doesn't it sound does, as good as Venomized. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't roll off the tongue. It doesn't. You know, when you get... And, you know, I don't know when the burnout's going to be on seeing every single character multiple times in a year being taken over by a carnage outfit or a symbiote of some kind. I don't know when that burnout's going to be. For me, it's here and way yeah. before this but people love it but it's super scarce like we mentioned there was right? a color version 
that was for sale at the Marvel panel. That color version is readily available. You can find them online. They're going to be exceeding 180 bucks very soon. A lot of them are listed for like 170 Now, this 1 in 25 variant. Now, it's, I, can't, I keep saying it wrong. It's not 1 in 25. Right, you're right. Right? Because There's that would, only 25 of them. Yeah, 25. There's 25 in existence. It literally says 1 out of 25 on the back. I imagine this book, once it hits, it's probably, they're all, probably all being graded right now. Like, I can't imagine anybody just grabbing that book and just throwing it on eBay. But if they did, I bet it would exceed 500. I bet we'd probably be pushing 1,000 for that book. I mean, what do you, what do you think? I mean, do you think we're going to see those come to market soon or not? The way I they, would, we, the way I they would would dispersed. I mean, yeah, if you're giving them to select people at the con who demonstrated. Okay, you know, let's talk about that. Yeah. How were these distributed? How do you pick 25 people to give this comic book to? It's like a golden ticket scenario. It's like Willy Wonka handing out tickets. Like, even that was random. Like this yeah. is this yeah. It was, is clearly... it's, it's more. It's yeah. It, that was even random. Yeah. Like this is even more exclusive. More targeted. Like you have to say the secret phrase at the right booth, and they're like, "Hey, hey, kid, we got this." Apparently, Marvel reserved this comic book for those they seemed were that were deemed worthy, whatever that means. You, it, you might as well be able to pick up Thor's hammer to get this. Like worthy enough to get it. Like it's. It's interesting, you know, to make 25 issues to only give out to the the worthy or not even the worthy, but it was the ones they selected that felt they were the best representation of maybe collectors in the marketplace. And Probably maybe, like really up on the stuff. Yeah, up on the stuff that maybe we've heard of because, I mean, how else do they hear about them? I mean, right. I don't know, unless personal. I, I'm not even sure how, Yo, how this, they pick these people. This had to have been a surprise. I imagine that no one knew about this. Because there was there was some rumblings through the con floor. I mean, I heard, oh, did you see? There's a there's a Carnageized variant. You got to try to get it. But I thought it was just the color one. I didn't find out till after the fact that this comic book even existed. And you know, there was a time I went to to PAX. This is just a, a one off little story. But I went to PAX to to check out a couple independent games that I'm a fan of a few years ago. And I wanted to see this independent like panel for a game called uh, Don't Starve. It's a random indie game. game. It's, it's a lot of fun, right? No, that's what you meant. Yeah, so I was behind, you know, talking to the people behind the booth, and as soon as they realized that I played the game regularly with my friends, he's like, the person behind the counter was like, oh, yo, by the way, before you leave, take this lanyard. And he gave me a Don't Starve lanyard. Didn't think anything of it. Turned out that they only made like 100 of them at that, four, it was for that Seattle convention. And I went on eBay, because I, I have it on my keys. I still use this lanyard. But on eBay, they go for like 50 bucks. So what happens is at these conventions, these publishers provide to their employees some merch. And I think that's what happened here. Employees were provided these comics as kind of a tool to just cause a ruckus on the con floor. And that's what they did. They picked 25 people at random. So it's just, you know, adds some encouragement to when you go to these panels to talk to the people, to hear them out. Not just because you're trying to get something from them, but because it's like you're going to find out cool stuff. And if you seem to be that fan that is worthy of something, you could come out with a book that I bet is going to go for over a grand soon. It's also an awesome series, by the way. Silver Surfer Black has been great so far, and it's worth reading in any format. That's a good point, too, because it is supposedly a really good title and read. It's reads, trippy so that helps. As, as all get out. The art, man. What, yeah. did, what did Kate's like? He showed it to us. You remember that? Mm -hmm. We saw that. We were at Emerald City, and he was wearing a maximum, Donny Cates, Sir Cates, was wearing a, a maximum carnage shirt. And he started laughing about how, like, it, you know, it's funny. People ask me to spill beans on stuff, and I tell them I can't. But Marvel can't tell me what to wear. And this was back in, like, March or something, April? Yeah, and this is before any announcement. Before like, Silver he, Surfer Black he was even announced, I think. And he showed us a little bit of uh, a little bit of preview art. Yeah, it was on his phone. Yeah, on his cell phone. It was yeah. black and white. It was uncolored. I couldn't even tell what we were looking at. Because if you're familiar with this comic, the art is very loose. He's like, do you effing see this? How crazy this effing stuff is? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, got a, he's got a potty mouth. He is so excited to talk about it. And you know, for good reason. Because the art on this is all people are talking about. Yep. Yeah, it's acquired taste for some. But this is an artist who is like the artist for artists. This is the artist that our favorite artists enjoy. Yeah, Trad Moore. Yeah, this guy's killing it's, it. It's crazy. Thank you so much for watching and listening You know, to our, our audio listeners. Um, to our first show. It's going to go like this going forward. I hope you enjoyed the little, little bit longer format. We're going to keep adjusting. We're going to keep moving, mold into what you want. Let us know in the comment section what you thought about it and what you would like to see more of. I'm super excited. We also have a couple more things to talk about. You have a story about what comic book that you just got graded? 
Oh, the crow. Ooh. Yeah, I had in my personal um, one, two, and two copies of three. That I just got back from CGC. So Ooh. okay, I'm excited to talk to you about that. Yeah. And then Ryan, you also have some stuff to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, House of X and Powers of X for a little bit. The new uh, X-Men relaunch that Jonathan Hickman is spearheading. Oh, I'm excited to hear about that. But if you want to check out this conversation, we're going to continue it audio only on, again, any platform that you listen to podcasts on. iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. I'm even, where are we? We're even on SoundCloud because I'm a SoundCloud, you know, diehard supporter. Yes, he so, is. You know, you know how I roll. All right. Shout out to Key Collector Comics, the best comic book app that's on the market. Use code Tom 101 to get your free week subscription and, you know, all the goodies that come with having a membership with that app. Remember, guys, geek responsibly. Make sure to like, subscribe. Yeah, we got more content your way. We appreciate you, comic fam. As always, geek responsibly, guys. Enough said.